Hello, welcome to the self-learning platform by Dr. Shishma Singh. Today we are going to start Unit 2, Approaches to Study Social Movements, Liberal, Gandhian and Marxism. And our topic is Structure Function Approach. There is a great deal of variation among the non-Marxist scholars. In their approach to the analysis of social movement, the ideological positions regarding a need for social and or political change and the role of movements therein differ. It is argued by the several liberal scholars such as William Conisher, Robert Nisbet, Edward Schill and others that mass movements are product of mass societies which are extremist and anti-democratic. These scholars are in favor of excluding the masses from day-to-day -day participation in politics which hampers the efficient functioning of the government. Some Indian scholars who approved of the agitation for independence from foreign rule did not favor agitation by people in the post-independence period. They condemned them outright as dangerous and dysfunctional for civilized society. Though some other liberals do not favor revolutionary change in the political and economic structure, they advocate political change which is confined to change in the government and political institutions. A few are of revolutionary change but they differ from Marxist scholars in class analysis. They lay emphasis on political institutions and culture. In their analysis of the movement, some do not inquire into social and economic causes of conflict and collective struggles. Others differ in their emphasis on the causes responsible for the movement. Some emphasis individual psychological traits. Some focus on elite power struggles and their manipulation. And some others emphasis the importance of cultural rather than economic factors. The scholars who adhere to the theory of political development consider that the rising aspirations of the people are not adequately met by existing political institutions which are rigid or incompetent. As the gap between the expectations of the people and performance of the system widens political instability and disorder leading to mass upsurge increases. Rajni Kothari argued that the direct action is inevitable in the context of India's present day parliamentary democracy. The general climate of frustration, the ineffectiveness of unknown channels of communication, the alienation and atomization of the individual, the tendency toward regimentation and the continuous state of conflict which may remain latent and suppressed for a time between the rulers and the ruled. All these make the ideal of self-government more and more remote and render parliamentary go government an unstable form of political organization. It is also argued by some that the public protest have a certain functional utility. Even in a parliamentary form of government, David Bailey observes that before and after independence, a large number of people felt that the institutional means of redress for grievances, frustrations, and wrongs, actual or fancied, were inadequate.
Now let us discuss Gandhian approach. Mahatma Gandhi, the leader of India's freedom movement, has a far-reaching influence on social movements in India during his lifetime and in the post-independence India. Though Gandhi did not offer systematic analysis on social system, its functioning and causes of conflict, he was a critic of modernity as developed in the West under Industrial Revolution. He was against the capitalist economic system and he had deep concern for the poor, poorest of the poor. Conflict in society according to him is not because of conflicting economic and social interest among the communities or classes. It is because of different understanding of interest and society, different moral and ethical values on good and evil or prejudices against each other. During his lifetime, he led struggles not only against the British rule but also racial discrimination in South Africa against untouchability and discrimination to women. Purity of means in social struggles and resolving conflict is the central concern of Gandhian ideology. According to Gandhi, the means are as important as the ends in resolving conflict. For that, he strongly advocated ahimsa, that is non-violence. Violence, he believed, was not only wrong, it was a mistake. It could never really end in just injustice because it inflamed the prejudice and fear that fed oppression. For Gandhi, unjust means would never produce a just outcome. The means may be linked to a seed, the end to a tree, he wrote in 1909, and there is just the same inviolable connection between the means and the end as there is between the seed and the tree. We reap exactly as we sow. Gandhians advocate a need for resistance of those who are the victims and suffer against injustice. The method of resistance was Satyagraha. Satya means truth, Agraha means insistence or holding firmly. Bondurant has called this approach the Gandhian dialectic. Satyagraha was a dialectical process where nonviolent action enhances, engages existing structures of power in a truth-seeking struggle leading to a more just and truthful relationship. In this technique, the victim opposes unjust law and also the act of oppressor or foreign ruler, landlord or upper caste. They even break the unjust law in consequence suffer punishment imposed on them by the authority. Such peaceful resistance Gandhi believed would open the eyes of oppressors and weaken the hostility behind the repression rather than adversities being bold to capitulate. They would be obliged to see what was right and that would make them change their minds and action. But Satyagraha soon took on a larger dimension, one that was less a function of its spiritual provinces than its feasibility. Gandhi recognized that there were limits to the exemplary value of personal sacrifice. Even the most committed resistors could absorb only so much suffering and the pride and prejudices typical of entrenched regimes could not be dissolved quickly. If Satyagraha was to become a practical political tool, Gandhi realized it had to bring 
pressure to bear on its opponents. I do not believe in making appeals. He emphasized on moral force of the opponents. The potential of Satyagraha to change an opponent's position, Gandhi believed came from the dependence of rules on the cooperation of those who had the choice to obey or resist. While he continued to argue that Satyagraha could reveal the truth to opponents and win them over, he often spoke of it in military terms and planned actions that were intended not so much to convert adversities but to jeopardize their interest if they did not yield. In this way, he made Satyagraha a realistic alternative for those more interested in what could produce change than in what conscience could justify. The method of Satyagraha is often called a passive resistance, but Gandhi made the distinction between the two. In 1920, he argued that they were not synonymous. Passive resistance is generally practiced by the weak and non-violence is not their credo. Sometimes it had narrow self-interest which failed to reach out the opponent, but it is no so in Satyagraha. Passive resistance does not necessarily involve complete adherence to truth under every cir circumstances. Therefore, it is different from Satyagraha in three essentials. Satyagraha is a weapon of the strong. It admits of no violence under any circumstances, whatever, and it ever insists upon truth. David Hardiman cast Gandhi's method as dialogical resistance. For Gandhi, the adversity was not an army enemy. It is a breach of Satyagraha to wish ill to an opponent or to say a harsh word to him or of him with the intention of harming him. He believed in changing heart and reasoning of the enemy through persuasion and dialogue. But he did not rule other methods to build pressure on the opponents. He knew that in many cases reason by itself would not win an argument. This was where self-inflicted suffering such as fasting could be important. Additional political pressure was often needed and telling mass demonstration, non-cooperation, tax refusal, hartals and like. Wahar has termed Gandhi's approach to conflict as a self-limiting one. Gandhi was challenging a member of political and social conditions in British India. Most notably colonial rule, caste and religious discrimination and exploitation of workers and peasants. He had to confront these opponents but he had to do so without unleashing the enormous potential for violent upheaval existing in the India of that time. His moral and political philosophies found practical form in methods he used to inhabit runway responses to prevent the proliferation of issues. For example, Gandhi was careful to focus each Satyagraha campaign on a single clear issue around which agreement might be reached. This helped to keep the conflict within bounds. His practice of maintaining good personal relations with his opponents during a campaign prevented the shift from disagreement over an issue to personal antagonism. His policy of complete openness in both interpersonal and media communication reduced the threat and suspicion that 
scarcity and unpredictability introduce into a conflict here we wind up today's lecture thank you so much for your attention